Welcome. Okay. Welcome to the Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. I'm here with Chief Philip Terrell, um, Chief of Southwest Mutual Aid. And again, with Southwest Mutual Aid Fire Department, could you give me a little idea so we can tell the public what type of fire department you are? Well, we're actually an emergency dispatch center. Um, we're um, housed at the Keene Fire Department headquarters building um, on Vernon Street. We've been there since our inception back in the 50s and uh, officially opened the dispatch center in the Keene Fire Station in 1962. So we've been serving the communities, uh, all of Cheshire County and many communities beyond. Uh, adding up to 78 uh, towns in New Hampshire and Vermont and a couple of associate members in Massachusetts. Um, we were talking about the fire station. The fire station is an old building, a proud building, historic building. The Keene Fire Department is going to get their um, new fire station. And I heard that you're interested in, in, your organization is interested in buying the fire station. That's correct. Uh, we're, we're currently uh, in negotiations with the city to purchase the building. Um, we've been there for 55 years or so. Uh, we felt that uh, now that the city of Keene was no longer going to be using it as a fire station, that it would be uh, in the city's good interest and in mutual aid's interest to keep uh, the tradition of having it housed by someone in the fire service. And uh, so we're negotiating to purchase that building and keep our uh, dispatch headquarters there. Um, along with that, um, we would be moving our radio repair facility uh, into that building. Uh, we currently uh, take up some of the space at 350 Marlboro Street, and uh, our dispatch center has a uh, small radio shop uh, with three technicians, and we service the radios in our mutual aid system and some radios uh, outside of the system that are still public safety radios. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to go the on-scene where we're near the dispatch station, but a lot of people just think that's all the only space you use. You were talking about 350 Marlboro Street, but you have other equipment because we were going to talk about the, um, you got some boats and other equipment that's spread around the town. Well, actually what we have is uh, uh, housed at 350 Marlboro Street uh, along with our uh, radio repair shop. Uh, we also have uh, some trailers down there that we use uh, for different uh, aspects of our uh, services that we provide to the communities. Uh, we have a 40-foot tra long trailer down there that we send out to the uh, uh, elementary schools or to uh, community uh, happenings uh, that provides us some uh, fire prevention, um, uh, like a fire prevention trailer where they can uh, go in there and uh, they can fill the building up with smoke and show the children um, what happens uh, when there's a fire alarm goes off at, at night if you're sleeping and, and how to exit the building, that sort of thing. We offer that. That trailer also provides, um, uh, it kind of uh, morphs itself into an emergency communications uh, trailer. Yeah, if we were to have to set up uh, at an incident for any length of time, we could go into the field, we could set that up as a communications trailer, a command post if you would, and operate our radios from there. We also have a, uh, uh, a trailer that uh, houses uh, some uh, mass casualty equipment. Uh, and that is housed as well at 350 Marlboro Street. That trailer is set up to, to go out to any town that needs it in the case of a mass casualty where they might need to treat 100 plus uh, patients. Um, we also uh, have a, a snowmobile and snowmobile trailer as well as a six-wheel vehicle and a trailer that houses that um, that we use to access our uh, antenna sites up on the mountaintops. And uh, those vehicles also get used in the case of sometimes you have an off-road rescue of some sort and we offer those up to our towns uh, if they need them. So there's quite a lot of equipment I think that people don't realize that the fire mutual aid system has and, and has a, a need to house. And so I think what, when, when in fact uh, we, we do purchase the old fire station headquarters building, um, we will pretty much fill up the whole downstairs of that building with mutual aid equipment. And um, <clears throat> when you talk about for example the trailer with, with the kids, the old drop and crawl if you have smoke. Yeah. Stop, drop, and roll. We go over all that sort of thing with them. We have a, we have a pan on a stove that catches fire, uh, simulated, of course. Uh, show them how to you know, put a cover on, a, on the pot to, to make the fire go out, uh, that sort of thing. Um, we have the ability for children to practice uh, how to correctly pull a fire alarm. So there's a pull box in there. They can 
they can pull the fire alarm so they, they know uh, what to do uh, in case they see smoke or, or hear an alarm going off, they can actually pull that fire alarm hook and they'll know what happens uh, when, that, when that occurs. So that's quite different from where we're growing up with the principal or the teacher says, we're going to have a fire drill today, it goes out, we just go out, we get a head count, come back in. Right. Like everything, it's gotten a, a whole lot more high tech. And so by having this uh, fire prevention trailer, it, it allows the communities in our system to be able to have that on their site uh, for a day and to actually do their fire prevention program at their school using uh, a piece of equipment that any one town couldn't afford to buy. But because we're a mutual aid system, it's available to anyone that needs it. Okay, so what we're going to do right now, we're going to go, we took some footage, on, on-site footage, so we're going to go right to the command center and meet a lot of interesting um, folks that you have working for you. Very good. Okay. Good day. My name is Chris Roberts, the host of The Long Road. I'm here in Fire Mutual Aid with um, the Fire Chief. Fire Chief, yeah. Uh, uh, Phil Terrell. Phil Terrell. I always have trouble pronouncing all those extra names. Oh, yeah. And so we're in this little corner of the fire station. Most people don't even understand or even know that you're here. That's right. Well, it's, uh, it's a little niche that we've had within the Keene Fire Station uh, headquarters building uh, since uh, the 50s when we started. Uh, we've been in the same location. It has expanded a little bit, very little. Um, but, uh, but yes, we've, we've been here uh, since uh, 1957 and then officially opened as a dispatch center in 1962. Yeah, when I look around, it's almost like being on the helm of the Star Trek or being in AWACS. Can you introduce me to some of your, the people that are here? Absolutely. Uh, can we start with uh, the captain that's on duty uh, in the dispatch this morning? Uh, Joe San Germano. Uh, Joe is, uh, has been working with us for uh, over 20 years. Uh, he fills the uh, role of the uh, operations uh, captain. He's uh, in charge of the room uh, during the day shift. And uh, Joe, uh, when he's not here, is uh, the deputy chief in uh, Dublin, New Hampshire, deputy fire chief. Okay, and this gentleman over here. And this gentleman here is uh, Jay French. Uh, Jay's uh, been with us for a couple of years. Um, he currently he had worked prior to that for uh, Cheshire County uh, Sheriff's Department, but uh, but when Jay's not in here working for us, uh, he's a deputy chief for the fire department in North Walpole, New Hampshire. So uh, this was more to his liking, I guess. This is almost like being on CNBC, looking at the money traders and stuff. You know, getting futures, gonna make us some money. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this gentleman here uh, is uh, Kevin Kennedy. Uh, Kevin, Kevin uh, worked for us uh, back in the 70s, and uh, he left uh, to pursue a career of his own uh, in a well drilling business. And uh, after uh, he got sick of being outside uh, right. in the 20 below zero weather in the winter, That's he right. decided he might like to come back and work with us. So after being gone for more than 20 years, uh, Kevin came back to work for us and uh, is uh, a lieutenant on the shift. and. Uh, uh, Kevin uh, also uh, is a member of the Fitzwilliam Fire Department in Meadowood That's right. and uh, down in uh, Troy, so uh, he's also involved in the fire service. And you have one um, lady that's and hiding in a little cubby right. hole? In the, uh, <laughs> in the room behind us is uh, an area that uh, we use uh, for our uh, supervisors. And in this room, uh, we'll be able to find uh, Bonnie Johnson, who is a uh, captain. Uh, Bonnie's uh, been with us for uh, 25 years. Uh, Bonnie uh, also serves as our database administrator. Um, with our CAD system, uh, there's a daily updates that need to be done. If you can only imagine uh, 78 communities that we deal with uh, in New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, uh, somebody changes something every day. And Bonnie's responsibility is to keep that stuff updated. So we have the most current information. So if you change roads, roads directions, one ways, or put bridges or bridges out. Bridges out, that all gets changed, but changed by her so that when they get the information for an emergency, it's the most current that we have. So in a lot of places in New Hampshire, and especially in New England, we've got a lot of these old bridges that are being declassified, the weight being lowered. That's, bridges are uh, taken out or, the, or they are out of service for repairs, uh, so you can no longer uh, cross them. So uh, you have to gain entry to certain areas of communities by a different route. So we try to flag our uh, CAD system maps uh, with a tag that shows that that, that road's not passable th- for a certain period of time. Or maybe not passable ever again uh, if it's a bridge that we're dealing with, not just a road closure. 
So this is 24 hours a day. 24 hours. About four people every all time. Or? Um, the uh, we have four people here um, Monday through Friday because we have the database administrator here, uh, and and that's uh, during the day from seven in the morning uh, till three in the afternoon. Uh, after three in the afternoon, we have we go down to three people. Uh, we still staff the uh, operations uh, operations position, and uh, then after midnight or actually eleven o'clock, we go down to two people for that eleven to seven hours unless it gets busy and then we hold somebody over uh, we never go below two and we're generally unless we're really really uh, in the middle of a hurricane or a bad storm or or something like that there's generally four in the dispatch center so just with these four individuals you have a wealth of experience both in and out outside the fire service oh it's huge we're very fortunate in our dispatch center that our our years of seniority average about 14 or 15 years um, the national average is only three, so uh, we do. We have a wealth of information. The other thing that's uh, very nice for our system is we have uh, 20 uh, dispatchers, 10 which are full-time and, and 10 which are part-time. Of those 20, they live all over our region. So everybody brings something so to the mm -hmm. table, so to speak, uh, when it comes to knowing where something is or being able to get there quickly. So um, kind of like... Early this year, I went up to Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, and I got my Tom Tom, and I'm going, and I'm following this road, and all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of nowhere. It's a dirt road. There's no way I could turn around, but only the locals would know that. That's you would, correct. You would not know that on a map or, or whatever. So that's the beauty. Well, all of a sudden, we get an emergency, and it's on East Lake Road in Fitzwilliam, and we turn to Kevin and say, you're familiar? Yeah, I know that guy. I grew up with him. I went to school with yeah. his children, whatever the case may be. We have a call in Dublin. Joe knows Dublin, Peterborough. He grew up in that area. He knows it. You know, Bonnie's the same way. She lives in Marlborough. She she knows that area. So it, it, it's nice to have people that live in other areas of your uh, dispatch communities because they know the people personally. They know how to find things quickly. Maybe some shortcuts to get there. All that helps us. You said 73 communities. How many of those communities have their own dispatch center like this? 78 communities, of which nine of those are uh, what we call associate members that we don't do their primary dispatching for. But uh, no one else in those communities uh, that are not uh, that are full-time dispatch members have an additional dispatch center for fire or EMS. Because when I was talking to Chief Lamoureux, he was saying if you guys didn't exist, he would have to hire at least four full-time dispatchers just to handle key. That's correct. You still have to cover 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You still have to have uh, people that are available when someone's out sick or taking vacation time. Uh, he would have to have a minimum of four, I would think, to be able to staff. Probably six to eight just for vacation time, just for training, vac yeah. sickness. There's no way to fill those positions. You can't take a guy off the street and stick him in the seat and say, go to work. There's so many idiosyncrasies of the job that you learn from years of experience. You can't pick that up when you sit down day one. So, for example, if you didn't exist, the, pe the taxpayers of Keene may have to come up with about a half a million dollars more in taxes just to fund their own um, dispatch center. Well, I, I guess a good example I could give you is um, when I first came to work here, as was true with uh, Bonnie and Joe and Kevin, um, we dispatch for all the Cheshire County Police Departments as, well, as everything else we do. Uh, as the years went by and we got busier and busier and busier, it was uh, thought that the best uh, bet for the police department was to go on their own and have their own dispatch center. And the sheriff uh, was uh, gracious enough to, to host that. Um, but he felt it could easily be handled with one person on duty. And now I think you'll find they have two or three people on duty doing just police. And that their budget has grown to, you know, $600,000. And so... <clears throat> What, what do you handle? Do you just handle fire? We do uh, all fire and uh, EMS, emergency medical services, emergencies. We deal with uh, emergency management for the state of New Hampshire. We still, uh, I guess you'd say, um, clock up or, or, or take care of many police calls because we still receive calls for police emergencies here. And then we take the information and pass it on to the police agency that does the dispatch, whether it's Cheshire County, State Police, however it needs to be held, uh, fishing game. So if I'm a community up like Goshen, New Hampshire, and if I'm part of your organization, if I have a fire call, it comes here? There's a couple different ways it could come here. 
uh, it could come here on a seven digit number or a 352 mm -hmm. 1100 which we've had since the beginning or it, they could dial 911 and the 911 operator would know based on that community's okay. pre-plan if you will that they need to push the button for southwest fire because we're their dispatch center <clears throat> so again instantaneous right to you guys right to us increases safety increases reaction time Exactly. The other thing that it does is if 911 sends that information down to us, it automatically fills our screen with not only their address and who the caller is, but it puts their house on a map in that community so that we can find them immediately. <clears throat> you were talking about um, emergency management, and we were talking a little bit earlier off air about Hurricane Earl. <clears throat> one of the um, projections, a smaller one, said there's a possibility that Earl may become between the Connecticut River and the armpit of Massachusetts. That could bring us right, bring us right up here. So if, if it's a Cat 3 at 110 miles an hour, what would the emergency management, what would you people do? Well, uh, first off, uh, for, for those that don't know, we, we do um, have towns in southwestern New Hampshire that we dispatch for, all of this corner of southwest New Hampshire, 45 communities, and in Vermont as well, 33 towns in Vermont. Now, if it's going to come out of Massachusetts and up the Connecticut River, the first thing we're concerned with is Vermont Yankee because they're right there on the border and because we uh, are just outside of the uh, EPZ, we manage their emergency management oh, yeah. for Vermont Yankee. Yeah, you're doing acronyms again, a lot of people. Yeah. EPZ, what EPZ, is EPZ? Uh, <laughs> emergency uh, response zones. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, planning zones. Yeah. And uh, so we manage that on a normal basis. So we would have Vermont Yankee. If they went to an unusual event because of conditions down there got bad enough, they would go to an unusual event. And then we would have protocols that we would use for that. All the other communities along the river and outside of the river areas, we dispatch their fire and EMS. So we would manage any incident that happened initially here as the people that would receive the call. We would tone out the communities uh, that were affected and the fire departments and emergency services would go to work uh, to do their thing within their community. The communications would all take place from here. Um, we have uh, 17 uh, antenna sites in our, our mutual aid area that uh, uh, completely cover uh, the dispatch for our area. And as conditions worsened and mutual aid was needed from areas not affected, we'd also send help to them from other towns. Now that's because they're part of a mutual aid uh, agreement that, that costs those towns nothing to get that help coming. And to have that help in your town uh, when you have an emergency. It's all free because you belong to this organization. So you, you are from Dublin? I'm from Fitzwilliam. Fitzwilliam. Yes. So if there's a major, looking at your screen over here with a major house, if there's a major, say, 2-3 alarm fire in Fitzwilliam, and it's going to tie you up all day, what would Fire Mutual Aid do to help protect Fitzwilliam? We can send in additional towns to come in and cover the empty stations for Fitzwilliam. If, for example, Fitzwilliam's out and Meadowood and Ringe and Jaffrey are in helping them, we can bring Winston in or Richmond or someone else that's not being bothered by that call and sit in the empty station in Fitzwilliam and they'll cover the town. So you give the t sense of security. Yeah. And so you've already worked all this out so that you don't have to worry about any personalities. You say, if this happens, this happens. Yeah, it's all written right down in front of us. All the towns are, have numbers and we go by. We have eight or nine towns we can work with. <clears throat> and a um, little bit off the subject, when we were talking about fire mutual aid and a lot of people, because we were at the county last week and we were talking about how we're going to finance this and which way, who's, how it's going to be paid. I, I personally believe that everyone gets more than the money's worth, but fire mutual aid has a big effect on homeowners insurance and property insurance. Sure. If you belong to a, a bona fide mutual aid system, of which there are three in the state of New Hampshire, um, then you get a discount on your insurance if you're within three miles of the fire stations. Um, if you're not, then you, you're at a five mile coverage. So you, there is a savings to be had by being a member of a, the fire mutual aid system and the services that we provide to those communities. So there's savings to be had there. Fire personnel, they're like military personnel. All the Air Force guys always want the biggest, fastest jet. The ground guys always want the biggest ta um, tanks. But they're all expensive and they, you don't always need them. Um, there's some communities around the country, they got a hook and ladder, but they may only have one-story buildings. How does Fire Mutual Aid um, help save the town's money? 
everyone doesn't have to get all the big equipment because of fine mutual aid, correct? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, within the communities, uh, uh, a town may say, uh, well, you know, in our community we have a, a, a specific need for a ladder truck, which is a huge expense. Mm -hmm. um, but all the towns around it may not need a, a ladder truck maybe only once or twice a year. So, uh, so they don't have to purchase that because we can send a ladder truck automatic response on a call in a community that doesn't have that sort of piece of equipment. Or maybe uh, a heavy rescue truck that might only be used for uh, below grade rescue or technical rescue purposes. A small town may not need to, to make that huge investment because just down the street, one or two towns away, uh, somebody's already made that investment. So we share it. It's all, it's all shared resources and that saves towns money. Where it really saves money is here in the dispatch center because it doesn't matter if I'm dispatching for 10 towns or for 60 towns, I still need that basic uh, amount of equipment. I still need uh, computers, I still need radios, I still need CAD, a CAD system to track everything. And, and if, if I only have 10 people and that costs a half a million dollars, well that costs everybody, t you know, divided by 10. If, but if I have 60 towns and I only need that same equipment, now we're dividing that up 60 times. So you were talking about how a house can show up. So if I'm in a small town and there's one three-story Victorian house, so it wouldn't need a hook and ladder, but all of a sudden it comes in and you know, oh yeah, that's a three-story, then you could automatically send their hook and ladder right there. Right. Many of our communities have uh, what's called um, pre-planned buildings or buildings mm -hmm. that we know ahead of time based on the address that they have special needs there. Uh, may, maybe it's a handicapped child, maybe it's a, a, a three-story building and they need a special piece of equipment to go to that. Well, when that address comes up on our screen, it indicates that. And so we can, we can automatically start that equipment because it's already been planned. So if it says, okay, the Maplewood Nursing Home fire on the third floor, you already know that, you know what type of equipment to send right to Bam, we know that it's gonna be a first alarm and we know that all this equipment's already been pre-arranged to go to that call. And so we'd send it right off with no delay. Okay, so um, this gentleman, what is it we've talked uh, before? Jay French. Jay French. And what do you do when you're sitting here? Besides oh. trying to get all this eye glare. <laughs> well, we take emergency calls, uh, non-emergency calls as well. Cat um, in the tree. Yep, we take those calls. <laughs> we've taken many of those. Um, so we dispatch on any emergency calls. Um, forward any non-emergency calls to chiefs or whatever if needed. Um, we talk on the radio, answering the trucks that are responding to calls. Um, we have some some departments out there that do alarm shots and got radio in instead of phoning in by phone. Um, so we answer them as well. Okay, hold on. Um, uh, day to day operations as well with uh, like the alarm systems and stuff like that that we monitor. So you monitor all the business alarm systems and quite a few businesses, residentials. Has it improved over the years? Do you get as many false alarms as it used to do in the past? Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of false alarms. Generally, when an alarm comes in, it's usually busy something. I know in team, we, as the number of false alarms go in, the, the number of the cost, the kind of the penalty for false alarms, that seems to. Have Slowing down when you get out to get paid for those false alarms. In the, in the city of Keene, you have Keene State College, which the kids are just coming back right now. You know, over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll have a lot more calls at Keene State College um, because those buildings now are being occupied again. The fire alarms will be set off by people smoking in the hallways, doing things they shouldn't necessarily be doing. Um, when, you, when you say false calls, well, False calls are malicious calls that are caused by somebody maybe activating a, a pull box or something like that. We receive an awful lot of fire alarms here, and, and those dormitories at Keene State College do get charged after a certain number of what they call false alarms. Um, but truly, the fire alarm systems in those buildings are doing their job. If they've been tripped and it comes in here, and we send out the fire fire apparatus, uh, that, that's doing exactly what it was intended. However, Second ambulance um, requested a lot of uh, departments uh, sometimes two, two, become a little lax in their Jackson responses to automatic fire alarms because they do become and, mundane. Uh, uh, but we, we, all, we here treat them very seriously because we have had so many times an apparatus show up on the scene of what would be a routine automatic fire alarm, if you will, and they got a room and contents fire or you know something's happened to actually cause that alarm to be tripped as it should have been, and then, it, and, and then something is truly happening there. So. Um, one of the big things I've been hearing about 
carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah. Do people have common oxide poison alarms come here, or is that totally separate? We have a CO alarms that we monitor on our, our receiver. Um, we, we don't do as many as fire alarms, but we do have them. Um, we do take an awful lot of phone calls and 911 calls for CO emergencies. You know, what people aren't feeling well, their alarm's going off, or their alarm's going off and they're feeling fine. And you get there and, and they don't have a problem, they need to change their batteries. Or we get there and they're feeling okay, but they do have high readings for some reason. And come, you know, they have a heating appliance that's not working correctly, or or some other reason. The car's been left running in the garage; it's attached to the house, and it's raised the CO levels. So yeah, we get we get a fair amount of those. Kind of like the ice storm a few years ago, where people hook up generators and they put them too close to the house, or people cook with hibachis or grills inside the that's house. That's correct. And so we get all sorts of alarms for that kind of stuff happening. Um, and, and we send out the troops for every time because that's, you know, that's what we do. The silent killer, right? right. And so we'll go to the ops officer over here. <laughs> Smiling face. <laughs> and so what, what do you do here every day? My function here is to supervise the operation of the dispatch center. It can be hectic at times. It can be hectic at times. My job does encompass a little bit more than that outside of the dispatch center. Um, my primary function when I'm sitting here, the bottom line, is to answer the phone and dispatch calls because I can't get that busy. Um, these guys are often tied up and so I'm either answering the primary calls or So when, for example, when you're talking to, give example, yesterday, you have the water main that breaks down on Lower Main Street, which ties up traffic. Of course, you got to get that in there right off the bat because if you have to have an ambulance or a fire truck going down there, you're not going to get through. It's going to take a long time to get through. You have Winchester Street that's tied up because all the kids are back doing their first one. Yeah. And so, and then, if for example, if you had an accident on the roundabout on 101, how do you get out of town? That's right. So that's all the kind of stuff that uh, that Joe and the other dispatchers here. That's the kind of stuff that we we have to be aware of. You know those sort of things happening because all of a sudden your responses cannot happen in the same direction they normally would. Or maybe your mutual aid towns that are going to come in and help the city would have to come from a different direction or a different town even. Um, some of the stuff that we do daily, that we, all, that we have a status board up here that put, we put road closings on, so that can go up there immediately, bang, we got a road closing, so that goes up there. Um, we have uh, like a, the medical examiner that's on duty or paramedics that we have in other towns that are available. That's all kinds of stuff that just kind of keep us fresh in uh, who, who some of those things are, what some of those things are happening right now, this minute. Um, and that changes, so that status board kind of takes care of that. Process. So we go 47 Depot Street, bingo, uh, yeah. Water Street detour into Water Street for five weeks. Yep, the 47 is actually the town of Jamaica, <laughs> and, because we do everything by every town is a number. Them. So it's almost like another language you have to learn. But the 47 is uh, Jamaica, and Depot Street from Route 30 to and 100 to Water Street is a detour, and and so that'll happen for five weeks. Um, the you know, that kind of stuff gets put up there. The fire danger of the day, class two. Because if it's a class three, we make an announcement that it's a class three day. And generally that means the wardens aren't going to issue any permits for that particular period of time. Class two day today, you're safe to get a permit today. Fire well, danger is down. Be, if we keep 98, 97, we may not be too, not class two at the end of the week. Well, <laughs> if the humidity stays high and uh, the wind stays down, that all helps keep that, that fire rating low. Yeah. And so when you talk about paramedics, so what you're saying is in, in the central fire station right now, Keene has three paramedics and Deluzio, the private one, has three paramedics. Has three paramedics on duty. So, so that's important to us, as you can imagine, because both of those uh, ambulance services provide service not only to the city of Keene, but beyond. And so if we have a, a wreck in Winchester, say, uh, and, uh, and they need a medic, we can look up on the board and say, oh, Deluzio has one available. So you would just pass that on to Deluzio? We, yeah, we would request that medic. Or if they had, a, there was a, a call that we felt, re, because of the criteria, uh, required a medic to respond, like a delta level call that required a medic, we would start that medic automatically before anybody even got there. And so you get the medical examiner, Rosie um, Swain. So yep. if there's a serious accident or a fire, and she needs to be there. Right. Or if one of our towns goes out 
uh, because they haven't heard from somebody for a few days and they find a somebody who has passed away, you know, of natural causes. The medical examiner still needs to be notified and she still needs to respond there and take a look to make sure nothing's foul. Uh, so so that, that's our responsibility too, to make sure those people get notified. A couple of weeks ago, we were in, we were in the other part of the building, the fire station. We went downstairs into their computer room and their wiring and it looked like it was ready to collapse at any single time, it was just a, as the um, chief said, he's trying to stay ahead of a, a disaster. <clears throat> Here you've got top of the notch equipment. We, we like to think we have the state of the art uh, equipment. Um, a lot of that equipment was purchased over the last two years uh, with grant money. Uh, our, our mutual aid towns that, that fund us uh, through assessments didn't have to come up with money for that stuff. We applied for and received uh, 1.2 million dollars in grants in the last uh, three years and that money all went to a renovation of this dispatch center, uh, ergonomically correct furniture for our dispatchers and the CAD system uh, that we're currently using as well as upgrades to uh, all our radios in our whole system. And uh, we are fortunate to get those sort of grants because it doesn't impact the taxpayer directly. Um, we don't have to raise our, you know, our operating budget to, to pay for those. Okay, again, if we go back to the ice storm or we have a major windstorm, the lines are out, everything's out, it's impassable. How do you keep communicating with the rest of the world? Well, if we, uh, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult. The one thing that we have going in our favor is that uh, because we do cover such a widespread area, we might be affected right here today, downtown Keene, but outside of our area a little bit in towns that we're still doing dispatching for and where our antenna sites are, are we're, we're not having the same sort of problems. We may have an incident going on in Vermont where an ice storm may affect a whole area and maybe we'll lose communications in that immediate area. But the way that our uh, system is set up, uh, we have redundancy built into that, and we have backup sites that are able to get in and take care of communications in those areas. So we don't go dark, we don't go dead in the water, if you will. Um, currently, uh, we're working to finalize what's called the simulcast system, which allows us to transmit on all 17 of those antenna sites at the same time. They push one button on the console, and we're talking off 17 sites at the same time. Um, until recently, uh, with the upgrades and equipment, it wasn't capable of doing that in what we call a fiscally sound manner. But uh, through some grant money, through some changes in equipment, we found a way to make it work. And uh, it, it, we, we have it up and operating and it's working great. Uh, I can have a call in uh, Jamaica, Vermont, and somebody in Peterborough hears it. So they know that we're busy dealing with an incident there. Um, so they switch to another channel. Uh, that, that didn't happen before. We could be talking in Jake, Jamaica, Vermont, and Peterborough could be talking on the same frequency at the same time and wonder why people weren't getting answered. Uh, so, th so that's uh, really been a, a terrific upgrade to our system we did this year. Well, with, with any electronic equipment, if your op chief's equipment goes down right now, how do you fix it? Who pays for it? Well, once again, Mutual Aid is fortunate in that we have run uh, our own radio repair uh, facility for uh, probably 30 years. Uh, we have three full-time radio technicians that are on call 24-7. Um, if anything in our system goes down, these guys are intimately knowledgeable of that equipment. They'll respond and either fix something here or they'll go to one of the hilltop sites where we have antennas and they'll fix that equipment or replace that equipment immediately. Uh, we don't have to be re relying on uh, uh, an outside uh, radio shop to uh, to free up somebody to come help us. We have people that do that within our own system. If, if Keene radios go down, the Swansea radios go down, does Fire Mutual Aid help them? Yes. Yes, they do. And we, we do deal with, uh, with uh, Keene's radios, um, all of their radios. In Swansea, Swansea uh, does have a local radio a repair facility down there that does some of their uh, town radios. But if they had an emergency where their radios went down, our shop would respond there and help them like that. The, um, you had talked about Vermont Yankee earlier and, and grants. There's a lot of communities that have been getting a lot of sophisticated um, testing uh, equipment over the, the last five or six years as a result of some lessons learned on September 11th. 
but with those specific and high tech pieces of equipment, they need a lot of maintenance and they need a lot of work. And we've been hearing that a lot of the communities have got them, they've gone out of warranty and they don't work, they're sticking on the shelves because they don't have the skilled technicians to help them. Well, the, uh, the equipment that has uh, been purchased in our area, and, and I don't say for Miami yeah. Fire Mutual Aid, but in our area, all the equipment that's been purchased uh, through okay. Homeland Security grants and that sort of thing has just recently been offered the ability to sign some maintenance agreements and have grant money available for that. Uh, we, we didn't have any grants that were capable of funding maintenance agreements and repairs for equipment like that until just recently. Um, the uh, grants uh, program in Concord uh, sent out paperwork in the last week that's going to allow people to apply for and get funding to help them to maintain and keep that stuff up. Yeah, because I know the, the assistant fire chief went to the city council and there was a grant of a bit more than $100,000 and part of that deal was, was going to be the maintenance equipment. And for example, you're talking about two pieces. One, you can stick it in the building to measure the different airs and oxygens that were in there. Uh, yeah, the uh, the fire departments, uh, several of our fire departments in our system have uh, monitoring devices that, that monitor uh, any sort of, uh, well, carbon carbon monoxide is a perfect example of that. Uh, yeah. Most fire departments okay. in our system now have carbon monoxide detectors right, no, that they you. carry. But Keen, uh, because they have a hazmat team, they have uh, some specialized uh, detection equipment that can monitor all sorts of uh, bad stuff. And, uh, and then uh, beyond them, um, because we are a mutual aid system, because we, we do know how to contact resources within the state. There's a uh, division of uh, the National Guard called the 12th CST, it's a civil support yeah. team, and, and they help out here with the Keene Pumpkin Festival every year, but they're also available at no cost because they're a federal asset for us to call and say, we have a problem, can you come help us? And, and they will provide not only uh, monitoring for chemicals and radiological, all that sort of stuff. But they also have uh, some emergency communications equipment that's uh, high-tech satellite stuff that they could bring in if we had a big event and use. Good call. <laughs> okay. Let's go upstairs and look at your palace that you have upstairs. Okay. Well adorned office. Yeah. Do you, do you want to go up... Uh, through the fire station, or would you like to go up the spiral stairs? I noticed that he was talking about divers. Yes. What, what did you do with divers? Um, we have uh, the ability to uh, dispatch dive teams to any uh, emergencies that involve uh, people in the water or maybe boats that are in trouble on the water. And um, the Meadowwood Co County Fire Department, which is a, a private uh, fire company uh, that was organized in, in uh, their original organizer, uh, Donald Holbrook, uh, was, a, was a help in the founding of this mutual aid system. But they have a dive team and a lot of things that Meadowood provides is specialized services. Uh, for years they provided us with a, a big reel truck with a thousand and thousand feet of four inch hose and, uh, and they have a tower ladder which is, is kind of an unusual piece of equipment in our area. Um, they have a dive team uh, with, a, with a rescue boat and uh, a specialized uh, cascade system with lots of air, that sort of thing. And uh, so they've been utilized since our start for all that kind of specialized equipment. So like for a couple of years ago when the train went into the Connecticut River, or some people build their fishing houses, bob houses on thin ice? Somebody goes into the water, we send a Brattleboro dive team, we send the Meadowwood dive team, we may uh, notify state police uh, in Vermont have a dive team and uh, we will utilize uh, generally two dive teams whenever we have an incident we try to send at least two. And again dive teams are, they're expensive, they require special equipment, a lot of training. Right and it's not something everybody can have so it, it works great that we have two or three throughout our system and the call, few calls that they get for their needs we can lump all those calls together and, and they, they stay pretty active. Okay well yeah. make up well, the, come um, the, to the office. office. Fireman can't slide down these stairs, huh? We need to put a bowl in, I guess. <laughs> so here we are, Chief. We're we're now in your palace. Well, we're uh, we're in the office of the fire mutual aid system. Things are kind of stacked high to the ceiling because the space is limited. Um, we've been uh, fortunate uh, since our existence in the 50s. 
that the City of Keene, the Keene Fire Department has been gracious enough to have us here. Um, and so our office, although it wasn't always in this room, uh, it's changed a couple of times over the 60 years, but we have a small office. We have windows that look out <laughs> the front, which are always nice. Um, and we have all the basic stuff we need. We, we have our files here for all our towns and you know, we have uh, faxes and copiers and I have at my fingertips, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff that we need to manage the operations uh, administratively uh, of, of our dispatch center. Well, she um, got cleaner and cleaner and less muggy smelling rooms than the other side of the building. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess. I know that uh, the, the building has its issues sure. and I guess we'll deal with that um, yeah. at, a, at a later um, time, but the, uh, we're, like I said, we're, we're fortunate to have the space here and we're fortunate to have the relationship with the Keen Fire Department that we've had all these years. When um, we do the show, when we go back into studio, we'll talk about the future, about Southwest Mutual possibly buying this building mm -hmm. because you have, um, <coughs> you're spread all around the town. Oh yeah, we are. Absolutely. And people just think you're, you're a small area, but when you talk about all those other things, you need to put them all in one place. That's right. We, uh, we, we do have equipment spread all over, and one of the things that Joe, uh, the captain downstairs, didn't go into any detail with, and he said he had other responsibilities. Well, his other responsibilities are to all the vehicles uh, that Fire Mutual Aid has. Uh, we have a 40-foot uh, uh, communications trailer slash fire prevention trailer, which uh, we purchased with a grant uh, through uh, Homeland Security and uh, the Firefighters uh, Grant Program. And we use that trailer not only for emergency communications outside of the building here, but we also use it for fire prevention uh, in, in the communities that we dispatch for. So uh, that 40-foot trailer gets moved, particularly this time of year, we're getting started to get busy, September, October, when fire prevention week comes up, the schools in our area can request that trailer. We take it there, we set it up, and they can do a fire prevention program with it. We can fill that building up with smoke. Uh, we have a, a pan that burns on the stove, uh, all, all that sort of thing. So. That trailer takes up a lot of space, and so for the future, it'll be moved in here. Um, currently, it lives at 350 Marlborough Street. So when we look at this, the historic document. Yep. AFI Mutual Aid System, the only one of its kind in New Hampshire. This fire claimed life, one life, Mutual Aid may have saved it. Quite a big difference. Quite a big difference from the way things were uh, in 1962 to what they are now. Um, at the time, we were the only one of its kind in New Hampshire. We were organized under an RSA 15430, which it helped us to establish yep. a district fire mutual aid systems. And since that time, uh, there, there are two other in, two others in the state that are fairly large, but uh, only equal us if you if you add them together, uh, as far as size goes. Um, but Lakes Region uh, Mutual Fire Aid. Uh, which is a uh, house up in uh, Laconia at the old state school building. Uh, they have their dispatch center there and Capital Area Fire Mutual Aid, which is in the old waterworks building in uh, Concord. Um, and they are actually, they have a chief coordinator uh, like myself, but they have no full-time employees. Their employees are all uh, members of the Concord Fire Department that staff their dispatch center. So I, I want to thank you and again, uh, you thank you with your, your gentleman and the lady downstairs for giving us a great tour of the building and we'll continue on talking in the studio. Good, terrific. Okay. We're glad you could come out today and take a few shots of where we live <laughs> and how we function. Okay. One of the big things coming up, one of my many hats that I have, whether it's city council, school board, it's also the county delegation. And one of the big things that are going back and forth is the funding. The, the funding for Southwest Mutual Aid that's collected through the county and the county's tax, tax statement? Yes, yeah, let me clarify that just a bit. Um, the 23 communities in Cheshire County um, are assessed like all of the other towns within our mutual aid system. The only difference is that how that money is collected. Um, towns within Cheshire County uh, have the, uh, what I call the advantage of Cheshire County acting as their representative and um, collecting their money through their county tax. And then we, as a mutual aid system, submit a single bill to Cheshire County for those 23 towns. And Cheshire County pays uh, the mutual aid system in six equal payments the first six months of the year. 
So um, if, for instance, uh, the 23 towns total came up to $600,000 for the year, then Cheshire County would um, tax the communities for that $600,000 uh, accept their income through their county tax, and then they would pay paid six equal payments um, of uh, you know $100,000. So for the first six months, they would make payments. The rest of the year, they wouldn't make any more payments because they will have you know satisfied the, uh, the, the the that bill, if you would. The other towns in the mutual aid system in both New Hampshire and Vermont are assessed exactly the same, but they we bill their towns directly. So that's the only difference. When the mutual aid system was originally set up in, uh, in the early 50s, and, in, and when they, uh, the RSAs were finally passed in 57 and 58 to establish district fire mutual aids, Cheshire County was a big part of that. And there was a, um, an agreement made that they would act as a banker, if you would, to, to the mutual aid system. Um, and, and that uh, process has worked uh, very well. Like you said, recently there's been some some talk about changing that formula so that uh, we build the Cheshire County towns directly. But I think it has worked out uh, real well for Cheshire County communities that the county does act as their banker. And, and the banker is in, important because cash flow, and so you don't have to go out and take loans and pay interest to keep your cash flow going. That's correct. Um, if we did not receive those um, uh, payments, stipends, if you would, from the county at the beginning of the year, then we would, in order to be able to function, we would have to go out and borrow money from a bank to, to operate for the first three or four months in order until our revenue started coming in. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what happens is many of the communities in our system, uh, their, their uh, fiscal year differs. Some are July, <laughs> some are January 1st, and so it, it be, some towns don't pay uh, their assessment until after their July meeting, and others have to wait till March, and you know when they have a town meeting. Mm -hmm. So the, just the funding process works very smoothly the way it is. Um, we we hope that uh, the Cheshire County mm -hmm. will will remain um, uh, doing things the way they have been, and uh, because it works well for us, and I think it does for them as well. And in a lot of ways, if you you switch it. It doesn't save any money because, for example, Keene pays $168,000. And as we talked before in the film, we could not hire dispatchers for $168,000. We're getting our money's, more than our money's sure. worth. <clears throat> but if you go and do it, say, for example, that $168,000 is collected as part of the county assessment. If the county decides not to do it, the county assessment will go down a little bit, but that $168,000, whether it's Keene, Swansea, Marlboro, whatever, it then will be collected as your town or city's portion of the taxes. That's right. And then the question would be, who, where does that come from? Does, it, does the fire department have to raise their budget by $168,000 to pay that, that dispatch cost? Or where does that funding <clears throat> come from? It still ultimately has to come from the community, and it's going to come out of somebody's budget. And one of the benefits of fire mutual aid is the mutual, no pun, but the mutual coordination. So if the county doesn't do it, then you're going to have to have 23 separate accounts, one for every... That's right. We would have to bill those towns individually and then uh, hope that they would pay uh, in, you a know, timely manner. in a timely manner so that we, we could, could make our uh, payroll and that sort of thing. Uh, we, we're pretty much, uh, you know, uh, hand, hand in mouth. So if we receive money, then it goes back out to pay salaries, benefits, and, and the cost of operating our system. Um, we we do save the community and the and the mutual aid system a lot of money by uh, being able to incorporate so many communities into sharing the cost. It's like buying this fire station yeah. building. Um, you know, we're hoping because we have so many communities that are help pay for that, that the, the impact to any individual town will be slight. And one quick thing on, on the fire station we had mentioned in the film, but if, if you don't get to keep the fire station and you move someplace else, all those microwaves, all those communication systems have to be moved. They have to move, and, and the logistics of moving uh, a radio system uh, like that and all the equipment that goes with it is just it's a nightmare. So we're hoping to stay right where we are. makes a lot of sense. And so with the microwave, and we again, we, no matter one of those communities call, 
it comes to your dispatch center. You dispatch it out. So if Keene has to go to a major fire, you have someone to fill in, so Keene is always protected. Right. It's called covering stations, and um, if Keene goes out and their station's empty or, or even down on equipment, uh, many times we'll uh, bring in, uh, say, Marlboro to come right in and cover or Spofford or, or someone like that, depending on where the call is, that would cover in the station until um, somebody uh, got back in service uh, from Keene and uh and therefore that that all happens uh, without anybody even knowing it you know it uh we we moved a lot of equipment the other day uh, down to Marlboro for a fire they had on the Keene line and you move a lot of equipment into a scene and and right behind that is all the cover trucks they come to cover all those empty stations to make sure that the communities still have fire protection while their departments are out fighting fires in other towns and all those cover that saves personnel, that saves equipment, that saves an awful lot of money with all these different communities. It certainly does. You, you, you could never afford to pay uh, for all the equipment or the number of firefighters that would be necessary to cover your own community all the time. So it's a, it's a great savings. Our mutual aid system does save a lot of money for everyone. Well, we only got about two minutes left. And what about Vermont Yankee? How, do you, how does Southwest Mutual Aid work with Vermont Yankee? Well, Vermont Yankee, uh, we, we are the uh, dispatch center for all of the communities that make up the uh, EPZ towns for Vermont Yankee. What that means is if Vermont Yankee has an incident, uh, we would be the people notified and we would put out tones for all the communities that would have to respond to an incident or respond as uh, shelters for people that would be moved away from that area. And... Um, I think there's been a good partnership uh, struck between Vermont Yankee and Fire Mutual Aid. Um, they do provide some funding, a funding source through um, some emergency preparedness grants and things like that that help to, uh, to buy equipment and keep us uh, kind of up to date on technology or with technology. Okay. Boy, this show went really fast. We're down to the last minute. I really appreciate you being here, and hopefully we'll get together again and we- discuss some other information, other things that Southwest Mutual Aid helps the communities? Good. I've uh, appreciated you having me in today, and uh, I look forward to uh, meeting with you again and uh, getting the word out to the communities about uh, what your mutual aid system does for you and uh, and how it saves you money. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Refreshments provided by G. Housen Distributors. Premium beverages delivered.